called. Cause I called, you answered, and you came to my rescue, and I want to be with seated for communion. Uh, okay, everyone can hear me definitely. Um, good morning. How are y'all doing today? Uh, well, if you don't know me, as you've heard, my name is Patrick. Um, I, I born and raised in Brooklyn, moved here, uh, uh, tail end of 2020, and it's been an interesting experience uh, living here so far. Married to Kim, wonderful Kim. Uh, got three wonderful uh, kids running around doing their kid thing. Um, today I have the opportunity to talk to you about the cross and what it means to me. Um, and recently, uh, we moved, we bought a house, yay, amen. Thanks be to God. That was the most exciting, frustrating, annoying, <laughs> tiring experience I think I've ever had. Uh, don't wanna do it again. Um, that is not something I wanna do again. But um, our realtor was amazing. Uh, she made the whole experience as painless as possible, of course, until you sign your life away, <laughs> paying that mortgage. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> 30 years. Okay. Um, <laughs> one of the things I experienced that was amazing was uh, the day of the move. Um, we didn't know how much people were going to come out, right? We didn't know how many people were going to come out to help us, uh, you know, kind of spread the word out. Hey, boop, we need some help. And like 16 plus people came out to the, to help us move. I mean, we did our part. Thank God. Uh, Kim is a taskmaster. Uh, when it comes to getting that stuff out of the house. But we tried to make it as smooth as possible. Uh, oh, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, just try to have the big stuff, you know. Uh, and so I just, and it was going to rain that day. It was like, oh, my gosh, please, Lord, don't. Like, let us get the stuff in the truck and put it next to the garage before it rains because I don't want this stuff to get wet. Uh, we don't have plastic wrap. And so... Um, but it, it went off with a hitch, without, without a hitch, and it was beautiful. Um, and so every, every day since then, I've experienced a different side of uh, community to, an ex uh, to, to a greater extent. Um, neighbors, uh, literally yesterday, I was trying to mow the lawn. <laughs> Sam Martin has been a, a, a blessing to my life. Uh, he, he, he gave us uh, a lawnmower. I think it was his mom's. Uh, and so we were using it. And, and you know we were trying to get it working, and the blade was was rusty because it was old. And it's it's fine. It was perfectly working, but it's just you know, whatever things things happen. But it wasn't cutting as well. And then like my neighbor literally right across from me was like, "Hey, you want to use my lawnmower?" I was like, uh, "Sure." <laughs> Came through. Lawnmower was cut and just just woof. Wow. Uh, low fade cut to my whole lawn. It was beautiful. Um, <laughs> I was trying to like give it, you know, like a little pat, but no, that wasn't gonna work out. Um, and then he was like, uh, you know, do you want it? I'm like, ah, uh, sure. Yeah, I'm moving, so you can have it. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I have a, I have a, uh, uh, an edger. You want it? Sure. <laughs> Okay, let's go. Uh, and then uh, a neighbor across the street was like, hey, uh, we see you got, you know, the little ones. Uh, we have a car seat that we don't need anymore because our, our grandchild, you know, kind of aged out of it. Do you want it? I'm like, 
sure. <laughs> In my mind, I was like, I gotta see this thing before I start taking it, cause I, you you never know. You know, it's car seat, kids fill up, whatever. It was beautiful. It was like it was one of those car seats where you're like, do I want to spend the money? I do because it's amazing, but it's like five hundred dollars or whatever. Because car seats are, car seats are expensive. Oh my gosh! Anyways, out of control. Whoever said that? Yes, amen. Um, and they just gave it to us. And so why do I say all this? Um, I have two scriptures and one full thought. Um, near the very beginning of God's inspired text, um, a question is asked. And it feels like every story, moment, law, experience, and person later on screams back the answer. Uh, and of course, none so powerful as the cross. So let's jump into that real quick. Starting in um, Genesis uh, 4, verse 8, it says, One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Abel. Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? Now, in the NIV and some other uh, translations, it says, am I, am, I, eh, am I my brother's keeper? And to me, this is the most unhinged, wild response that you can give to God, knowing what you just did. The audacity, the cheek, the unmitigated gall <laughs> to turn to God and say, uh, am, I, well, am, I, am I his like babysitter? I was like, no, you horrible individual. And so I, I do want us to look at someone, though, whose response to that same question was different. And so in Mark 3, verse 33, Jesus replied in, in being asked, uh, you know, told, you know, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. He said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then he looked around to those around him and said, look, these are my mothers and brothers. And anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And then in another um, uh, scripture, Hebrews 12, verse 2, I know we're all up in Hebrews. It says, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Now, I, I may not be a scholar. I definitely am not. I'm not that intelligent at all. But if I can make an inference about the Bible, I think it's this, that Cain asked, am I my brother's keeper? And what follows is that every single example says, yes, yes, you are. And so the question is, are you answering that with your life? When you look at the cross, Jesus says it's finished. And people are like, well, if he was son of God, he could just call down angels, whatever, whatever, take himself off the cross. I mean, he could. I mean, let's be real. He could have. But he didn't. Why? Because he's answering that first question. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. And so I want us to um, reflect on Christ's response to Cain's question as we take the communion. Uh, let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you so much for life. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, to be well, really anywhere. Um, it's, it's amazing to think that so many different things had to have landed correctly for us to be even existing as a human species with the positioning of the sun and the earth and the, the moon, <laughs> asteroid hitting the, the, the earth and becoming the mood and, and atmosphere, all too much science for me. But it, it, at the end of it all, we have the perfect garden world for us to live on. And then you said, huh, I like the idea of these humans. And then you created us. And then you said, I mean, I really like them, so I might as well, you know, be with them. You know, and so it's just so many different things. And then even the idea of, of just me being here with the, with the understanding that my grandmother had to met my grandfather, who then had to have my mom, who then had to live long enough to meet my dad at the right time, and then I had to be born and then make it here. It's just so many things that are just mind-blowing. And... For me to take all that for granted and look at someone else who is also a miracle and to say, eh, 
Mm. No. Is a slap in the face to you and to them. And so I pray that as we take communion today, we do remember that your answer to the question of am I my brother's keeper is that yes, I am. And yes, you are. And so I pray this all in his son's name. Amen. Come on, honey, is that what I heard? <laughs> I would embarrass Janine, but I won't. Janine Spencer, how you doing? Anyway, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I get the privilege and the opportunity to share with you uh, about the offering. And uh, many of you are like, oh, great. Tink gets to get up here and talk about the offering. But I'm really going to share more about the humanity of God's word. And it's uh, I learned this uh, many years ago. Matter of fact, it was a guest speaker here, and it really kind of opened my eyes to the humanity of the Word of God. Uh, all of us kind of already know this, uh, and this is a uh, started off in Genesis, but it's also explained in Hebrews. It said uh, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the from the from death. God gave us a brain, and so. God never told Abraham, oh, by the way, I'm going to raise Isaac. It's that Abraham reasoned that God could raise him from the dead. And so that gives us the opportunity to step back that uh, the humanity of God's word is that we get to 
reason for ourselves what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. There are many things in the scriptures that are crystal clear, many things that we can go, yep, that is, that's sin, that's good, that's bad. We can know that. But what's really interesting in the, in the word of God is a lot's left up to us. A lot is left up to us to, to decipher, per se, or to interpret, or even better than that, just to reason. What is the right thing to do? What is the good thing to do? And uh, we'll go back here. This is kind of out of Luke chapter 10. It says, Woe to you Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. This is probably about the only reference. There's some other references that Jesus talks about giving a temple tax and giving a tenth and things like that. And so a lot of times we go, well, what's God's ex expectation for us? What's God's expectation for us in giving? What does he expect? Does he expect a tenth, a twentieth, everything and all, everything in between? And it's interesting because it's really kind of unclear other than Jesus expects us to give what? everything more importantly out of you know it uh, excuse me in romans 12 living sacrifices that the expectation from god is i just want everything i don't want most of it i don't want some of you i want all of you and so it's left up to us at this time how much do we give back to god because so much of our life is measured off of what we own and possess glenda and i are in the phase now in our life where we're giving stuff away, getting rid of stuff. We're no longer accumulating. We are now decreasing. We want smaller. We want littler. We want less obstacles. No, no more, uh, what do they call those, ki ki uh, kitchen, uh, the sit-arounds, ch tchotchkes. We don't want those. There's no those in our house, no sit-arounds. But yet, our son and daughter-in-law, they're in the accumulating phase. They have a garage full of accumulation already. They're trying to figure out how to buy a house to accumulate more because they need more stuff and more stuff. And you know what? Glenn and I are more than glad to give them everything we need. Just keep going. <laughs> just We know where to drive to Lawrence and drop it off. But that's just it's that's our phase of life. That's who we are. And the same goes with our the word of God is everything in our life is different phases. And so the word of God allows us the opportunity to reason throughout our life to figure out what is it we're supposed to give? What is it that we're supposed to be? And so right now is the opportunity to step back and reason for yourself, to take the humanity of the word of God and really think about what does God want from me? Not only on my day-to-day, -day, but out of my pocketbook, out of who I am and what do I consider important? Is the kingdom really that important to us? Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For him and through him and in him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to give back to you. We ask now as we either give online or we put it over in the box or just even in our daily lives that we are living sacrifices to you. We offer it up to you. We ask that we can walk with you, that we can be your disciples, that we can take the word of God and really apply to us and to what it means to us and how it means to you, how we're be obedient to you. We love you so much. We thank you for this time now. Jesus, we love you. Amen. Amen. It's been a great worship so far, right? Amen. You all look amazing. Good morning. My name is Kathy. I'm the communications director here at Gateway. Um, thank you for so much for coming and joining us this morning. If you're joining us from home online, hello. We're glad you're here. And uh, we have just a few announcements that we wanted to, uh, to share with you. First of all, uh, let's talk about Heartland Jubilee. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to acknowledge the elephant in the room because I know some of you tried to register this morning. And you saw the price, and it had already gone up, and you're like, what? And so I just got a text from Jessica in Kansas City. It has been fixed. So the price is $50 through today. 
Today is the last day to register for early registration. Uh, campus, the, uh, the price is still $10. Kids will be free right up to the door, but kids do need to be registered so that we can plan for child care accordingly. So get, if you haven't registered, today is the last day for early registration. The price will go up tomorrow. Heartlandjubilee.com, 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 or scan the beautiful QR code right there. So we hope to see you all. It's going to be amazing. I've, uh, I've been in on the co planning calls for this uh, for uh, for September 1st through 3rd. And uh, I think you're going to, if for everybody that does is able to make it, I think you're going to have a wonderful time. Um, going forward, uh, this coming Wednesday, we have our women's midweek. Uh, so ladies, come out. It's going to be fun. We're going to have uh, a light dinner uh, provided in part by St. Louis Bread Company. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to also have uh, some time of fellowship and a lesson, so it's going to be great. So join us as early as 6.30 p.m. At 7 p.m., we will move into the sanctuary here for lesson and devotional and worship. And then finally, uh, our blood drive is coming up on Sunday, August 6th. Uh, if you have not yet uh, signed up, the QR code... Uh, which will be up on in just a moment. There it is. Uh, the QR code will take you to the American Red Cross website. You can schedule an appointment. Yes, they do take walk-ups, but it does go much faster if you schedule an appointment so that you can get in and out. Uh, they've got appointments starting, I think, as early as 9 a.m. and then all the way up until 1 p.m. So you can uh, schedule as you need to. So that's pretty much it for today. We're going to have one more song, uh, so please stand, and then uh, Bill's going to come up and preach the word. Amen. Let's stand. How many of you love praising the Lord? Wow, all five of you. How many of you love praising the Lord, huh? Cool. Let's do it this morning. I need you guys' help. We're going to start with a clap. Yeah, that sounds good. Now, this has got to be high energy, all right? It's going to take a group effort. We're going to sing, you got to take the Lord. You gotta take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. You got there we go. The Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. Sing, you gotta take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. In the street, in the street, in the home, on the job, all alone. Highway, 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 highway. Disciples, daily children, everywhere you Sing go. It. You gotta make disciples, daily children, everywhere you go. Sing. You gotta make disciples, daily children, everywhere you go. In the street, in the street, in the home, on the job, all alone. Highway, highway, highway. Love our brothers, you gotta love your brothers daily, children everywhere. You Come on, Haley, you gotta love your brothers daily, children everywhere. You go, Paul. Sing, you gotta love your brothers. Edwin in the back. Come on, everywhere you go. Sing in the street, in the home, on the job, all alone. Come on, Ryan, my way, my way. Gotta love your sisters daily, children. Don't forget the sisters. Come on, sing. You gotta love your sisters daily, children. Come on, Tom, Chris. You gotta love your sisters daily, children. In the street, here we go. In the street, in the home, on the job, all alone. Highway, they go Carlton. Highway, 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 in the street, highway, in the street, in the home, on the church, just everywhere, the huh? The highway, 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 high
Are we good? Nope, not yet. Is it me or is it you? It, it, it's me, I know. No, still no? Test, 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 test. Test? Okay, there we go. All right, awesome, awesome. Well, welcome everyone. It's, uh, it's boy, I, I knew when that song started we were going to be in for a rhythmic challenge right there. <laughs> I just, as soon as we started clapping, I was like, no, nah, that is the wrong beat. That's not going to. We all felt it on this corner right over here. We were like, uh-oh, this is going to be rough. This is going to be rough. But it is kind of like what our sermon's about today. We start off in a lot of different ways trying to figure out how this is all supposed to go. But sooner or later, we kind of go, okay, we just need to settle in with whatever rhythm's coming our way. You know, we are in Hebrews. We're, part, uh, we're doing a seven-part uh, uh, study of Hebrews chapter 11. We have been kind of moving at a fast pace uh, because the author of Hebrews is trying to get us to find our identity in Christ alone. And he, he's saying that in order to do that, it is going to require something from you. It's going to require you trusting God even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it would be so much easier to put our hopes into things that we could see, something that's tangible, something that's, that's just accessible, it would be so much easier if we could just go with what we know, that we could just lean into what, we, what feels like it's true, and we could just decide for ourselves what God wants, and he'll just accept it. You know, the, the audience that the author is writing to had, had all of these traditions that had always defined for them, this is what it means to, to be with God. This is what it means to be God's people. And yet, even in that just basic understanding, they missed the one of whom the law was pointing. They were so fascinated with the comfort of the law and the rules and the checklist that they missed the lawgiver. And they missed the intention of what the laws were about. And then when God's solution came, when Jesus came and kind of broke that mold, kind of broke that ceiling and said, there is more to it than just being good boys and girls. You have a mission, you have a calling, you have something that's worth living for. But in order to find that, you have to come after me. When that came and all of a sudden just holding to the rules wasn't enough, the crisis of faith happened for them. And at first this group, they grabbed on to it, but then after the 30th anniversary of the church that was planted in Rome, after watching some of their own leaders pay the ultimate price for their faith, after the fact that they had been waiting for so long and still the Lord had not come, their faith is starting to waver. And so the author goes into chapter 11, He's like, okay, I've set you up to to know that Jesus is the only thing that we need to look to. He is the only one worth looking to. In fact, if you put your faith in anything else, you are wasting your time. Believe that. But then he goes, "But, but I'm not asking you to do something that you're unfamiliar with. In fact, some of your own heroes of the faith, isn't that what they did? put their hope in things that were unseen, had an assurance that didn't quite make sense on on kind of the humanistic level. Isn't that what impressed God? And so the author goes into this long list of people who do exactly what God wants us to do. It starts with uh, Abel. You know, Vince did a great job last week of kind of laying out of the type of offerings and sacrifices that God wants. He made it very clear that what God wants is simply our best. Because that's what separated Abel from Cain. And I love the fact that the Spirit put it on Patrick's heart to bring Cain up. Makes my job a lot easier, you know. You know, Cain offers some of the fruit. Abel gave the fatty portions because barbecue is of God. Can I get a witness? Don't bring me that, that impossible burger stuff. 
don't bring me that low fat lean meat. I need something to block these arteries if I'm going to see God. And God said, amen, Abel. You know what I'm talking about. Brought the very best, the very best he offered God. But grouped right with Abel in this chapter is a character that we're not very familiar with, but the audience certainly would be. And that's Enoch. You know, Enoch was one of their favorite personalities coming into this time. Hellenistic Judaism was built on this need to reinvent their faith because after all, they knew there were God's people to be in in the land, but they were in the land, but they weren't in control of the land. Rome was. What do you do when you know you worship the living God who is over all and is all, but Rome is sitting there trying to cram down your throat. Our gods are the one in control. Look, We're the ones with the military. We're the ones with the might. And might, you know, makes right. So how can you say your God is the true God when our God seem to be pumbling yours pretty easily? How do you hold on to your faith? Well, you look to the stories. And one of their favorite stories was Enoch. In fact, the author of Hebrews said it this way. Next slide. By faith. Enoch was taken from this life. We're in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, for those keeping score. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. That is awesome. By faith, Abel offered the sacrifice that was better. But by faith, Enoch did not experience death. Wow. You you know, this is one of those guys that everyone, when they talked of Enoch, they were like, ooh. By this time in history, if you spoke in Jewish circles as you huddled together and go, hey, let's build each other's faith up, what should we talk about? (laughs) Let's talk about the one who pleased God. His name was synonymous with pleasing God. He was the one, he was the barometer of what it should be like to have a relationship with God. He was their answer. Their answer was, we need to be like Enoch because he he got the ultimate gift. He got the ultimate reward. He didn't experience death. I mean, what a powerful life. If death isn't at the end of your existence, Isn't that what you want? Isn't isn't it the the fact that no matter what happens, that when this is all over, no matter what's transpired against me, I'm going to overcome it? That I'm going to see a forever tomorrow? That I'm going to experience reality for the first time in my life instead of this pretend stuff we call the here and now? Enoch was one that when they spoke, they spoke in reverent hushes. Enoch was pleased God. The funny thing is is that the Old Testament never says he pleased God. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I mean, we're we're listening to a first century teacher interpret the Old Testament for us. Because Enoch comes as a breaking of a certain pattern. A breaking of a certain pattern that is the normal pattern. Uh, Next slide. See, the way that it normally works for people who are of righteous mindsets is that this is how life usually plays out. This is uh, Enoch's dad, Jared. Everyone say hi, Jared. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. After he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived a total of 962 years, and then he died. There is a pattern there. Jared lived. He became the father. He became the father. Jared lived. Jared lived, and he died. That was the normal existence for someone of God's calling. Jared lived. He became the father. He became the father. He lived. 
Jared lived and he died. In fact, if you go through chapter 5, that's how everyone's introduced. That's how it all went down. Now, again, this is in contrast to the descendants of Cain, because these are the descendants of Seth. Cain had children after he whacked his brother. But it's interesting that his descendants only had one thing that was repeated, only one nomadic device, something that, that the, the, the ones that would pass this on through oral tradition, they just said his descendants just bore. They bore these children. They born, they bore, they bore. Not they became the father of, they bore. Not that they lived, no, they just bored. And it was interesting that that was the pattern until Limech, the seventh son of Cain, he, he, he's given a little extra press because he breaks the pattern. He didn't just bear a child. He actually took two wives and then apparently someone offended him and he killed that fool. And then he boasted about it. Limick said, Cain's revenge. Revenge on who? Revenge on his brother Abel for giving a sacrifice that was better than his. Cain's revenge is sevenfold. Limick's revenge is 77-fold. They were bearing. The best they could do was bear. He bore a son. Didn't even live. There was no life in that. We see that today, right? I mean, we kind of go, the world's crazy. It is. Because it seems like what is wrong with the world keeps multiplying. It's the pattern of Cain. They just kind of bear. They just kind of bore children into the same catastrophic system that they inherited. I mean, at least the line of Seth lived. They lived. They became the father. They became the father and they lived. They lived and they died. And that's pretty good. But there's one that breaks the pattern. Let's go to the next slide. This is how Genesis records Enoch. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years. And had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. It was What an amazing restatement of life. You know? And, and, and what, what's interesting is that to the audience of, of the, the letter of the Hebrews, the, those original hearer, hearers saw Enoch as the champion of repentance. Because his life starts off like all of his ancestors. He lived, and then he became the father. He became the father of Methuselah, which that alone might cause you to have to change some priorities. Methuselah. Methuselah molded, if we only had a boy. <laughs> Methuselah molded. We could have called him m m but we missed our shot, and we do not have our chance to flow. Oh, oh yeah, so I, so I got it. So I got it. Okay, okay. Anyway. You have no idea how hard I worked on that. I mean, what was his nickname? Meth? How did this guy ever get a date? What, are you into meth? <laughs> Enoch became a father. Enoch became a father. And then he saw whatever it was he was living for is no longer enough. There had to be something more. Something shifted in Enoch. Because instead of following the same pattern, the scripture says, Enoch walked with God. In fact, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say the word faithfully. That's the NIV trying to help us to understand the emphasis of that statement of walking with God. 
Enoch found his identity differently than his predecessors. He was the one that introduced this idea of what is it that God is really looking for from us? What is it that he desires from you? Have you ever asked that question? God, what do you want? What is it that you need? What is it that you're, 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 you're desiring from me? And the answer is simple. He wants us to walk with him. Enoch figured this out. Although it's, 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 it's evidence was there from the beginning. Go to the next slide. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him away. Next slide. Listen to this from the very beginning. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord their God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That little description from which our story as sin enters the world, that description describes what Eden was created for. This is what God wants. This is what he envisioned as he made man, as he completed man, as he, as he brought man and woman together, as he gave them the ability to name animals and gave them the, the ability to take care of the garden. What is it that he want? A pristine garden? No, he wanted a place where man as creation could walk with their creator. He wanted to spend this time. He came and he was walking in the garden in the cool of the shade in a knowable, tangible way. He was calling out to humanity. He was wanting them. And so it was such an incredible thing that the words of God in this location is, where are you? I want you with me. Somehow, after Enoch became the father, became a father, became the fact that I now know I'm going to shape this life. I am one through, through whom God wants to leave a legacy. I must walk with him. At that point, he breaks the pattern. It's not just about being alive, having a, becoming a father, becoming a father, being alive, living and dying. That is too small of a thing to live for. Enoch walked, and then he became the standard. Because, check this out. Next slide. In Genesis chapter 17, our, our, our boy Abraham, when he was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Did you, do you hear it? Walk before me faithfully. That's an Enoch reference. Abraham I have called you to be mine, but what I want from you is for you to walk with me. Walk before me. Next slide. Then, of course, here's, here's, uh... oh, thank you. Here's this. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers, my, my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. So this is Jacob blessing Joseph's children, kind of setting right the course of the rest of the story of God. And he says this little blessing, may the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd. This idea of walking also brings up this idea of being with a shepherd. It's funny because after Enoch, what God desired was that his people would see him as who he is, a shepherd. Next slide. This is a shepherd in the Holy Land. I know you can't tell, but if you're able to see closely, you can tell this is a little kid. This is how they get down. I, I, want, I want you to see the position of where this young man is. He's elevated. He's got a good view of things. 
He knows where the flock needs to go. But I also want you to see that he's behind the sheep. You know, we often have this idea of like, well, God's going to lead us. And he does. Well, God's going to come down and show us the way to go. And he did. But honestly, when it comes to walking with God, it is this idea of walking before God. Because that's what sheep do with their shepherd. See, the shepherd, I mean, this little kid is controlling hundreds of sheep by not walking in front of them, but walking behind and looking out for where they're going. And then he calls out with his voice. To the left. To the right. Left, left. Ho! Get back over here. <laughs> left. Straight ahead. On. On. Hold. And the sheep, because they're sheep, just, meh. just, they just, they're just sheeping. That's, that's all they do. You know, in fact, the way this, this young man controls this great flock is that he, when he, when he was little, when it, his older brothers probably were in charge, he was given a little baby lamb, a ewe lamb, and that became his pet. And you know that story of the ewe lamb and it was like a daughter to this guy and all of that. That's how they did it. They had one lamb who became the pet. And as that lamb got older, just like the boy got older, that lamb would do anything the boy said. And then when you turn a pet lamb into a flock and then the shepherd says to that lamb, left, that lamb goes, And then sheep, because of their nature, goes, well, if one's moving, I'm moving. Yeah, that's right. yep. And so this young man could control this entire flock with one obedient sheep who listens to his voice. There would be a story that Jesus would tell about sheep and goats. That seems to indicate that the difference between heaven and hell is a glass of cold water. But it's the response of both that I find interesting. What made a sheep a sheep and what made a goat a goat? Well, the sheep did what the shepherd would do. When someone was thirsty, they gave them water. When someone was in need, they met the need. When someone was in prison, they went to go visit. When someone had issues, they went to go meet it. No one, he, they didn't, the sheep didn't see anyone do it. They just heard. That's what, the, oh, is that what the shepherd does? That's what I should do. That's what made them sheep. Goats, on the other hand, ain't doing anything until I see someone else do it first. Not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But Lord, in your name, didn't we drive out demons? And in your name, perform many miraculous signs and wonders? Away from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. But I did all this stuff. No, you only did because someone showed you how. But you weren't listening to me. That's really challenging. And it's challenging because we live in a time when spending time with God doesn't get a lot of premium. Come on, bro. There's so much distraction. We open up our phones with good intentions, but then TikTok. We even have Bible apps on our phone, but we also have access to our text messages, news bulletins, you know, alerts. Edna's the only one that goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Praise be to Jesus. We have a lot of good intentions, but it's so easy to be distracted from the only thing that's going to matter. Next slide. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. What pleases God? 
us walking with Him. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. See, God knows that we need a good reward to motivate us, right? That we need something. I mean, come on, man. We've all kind of like, God, if you just get me out of this one, I need a reward. And sometimes God will bail you out. Can I get a witness? Students who, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Like, I didn't study for this test. I really could use some supernatural knowledge. <laughs> and sometimes you freak out the system and you, and you make it good. So, But that's not normally how it works. He rewards those who earnestly seek him. But what's the reward? Next slide. Genesis 15, 1. Do not be afraid, Abram. Why shouldn't I be afraid, God? Because I'm your shield. I'm your very great reward. Did you, do you realize that the reward that you're guaranteed is God Do you realize the implications of what that means? That if you spent time with God today, you've had a great day. No matter what happens tomorrow, if you made time to walk with God to try to hear his voice, you've had a great day. On the cosmic scale of reality, with him as the ultimate supreme reality, if you prayed to him and he conversed with you, is there anything better than that? I'm the great reward, he says. That's what he wants from you. But, but I think it's interesting that we can take this to another level. Let's go to the next slide. How would we answer this question? What do you do for a living? I mean, that is how... We figure things out where someone stands, right? When we meet someone for the first time, this is just, so what do you do? You know, speaking of TikTok, there was a little trend for a while where someone would walk up to someone in a really nice car and go, excuse me, what do you do for a living? And the answers were always ridiculous. But, you know, this is a question that God is going to ask of us. You know, we already introduced the one like, hey, where's your brother? You know, there's another question that when it's all said and done and we're standing before the throne in heaven and books are open and God is there, he is going to look down at you and say, what did you do for a living? What answer would you give him? I was a financial planner. I was a teacher. I was a nurse that helped many. That's not what you would say. Not in heaven. I look forward. I look forward to the day when we start answering that question differently. I look forward to when someone asks you, what do you do? And your response is, I met with the creator of heaven and earth every day for the last 30 years. What do you do? I lay my request before the one whose hand holds the entire universe. What do you do? I lift my voice to the one whose only appropriate title is King of Kings. What do you do? Oh, yeah? Well, I lift up my voice to the one who is the Lord of Lords. What do you do? I lay my request before the only thing that can take away my sin. What do you do? I lay my sorrows before, before the one who is a lion but came as a lamb. Hallelujah. I am, what do you do? I am the one that goes before God and stands in awe. Every day, because he loves someone like me. In fact, he moved heaven and earth just so that I could do this. What do you do? I walk with God. Put that on a business card. Take that to your job interview. You probably won't get hired. <laughs> but you will never be forgotten. Enoch 
walked with God. 3,000 years later, we're talking about him on a Sunday morning. 3,000 years later from today, what will people talk about when they talk of you? If it's anything other than walking with God, they won't. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. What do you do? Well, just let it be said of me. I just walk with God. Amen. Yeah. Now, we have a special occasion today. Because a young man has decided that he no longer wants to live in the pattern of this world. I can't wait for you to hear his testimony at some point. But I assure you is much more in the line of Cain than it was of Seth. He's born a lot. He's changed a lot. And today it's time to bring him to the Lord. So Chang, let's go. Mute this. Amen. So uh, Chang, for the sake of time, we're not going to be able to do a lot of sharing, although we have much to say. But uh, there, there will be a party for him at our place at 5 because that's becoming the standard place to celebrate. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but, uh, Ching, today is an amazing day. Uh, this is a day that God has chosen to glorify himself through your life. And you're a man that's worthy of God's love because of who he is, but because of the decisions that you've made to get here. And so, Ching, I have a question for you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Okay. Do you believe that he came to earth? Yes. Do you believe that he died for your sin? Yes. How about that he rose on the third day? Of course. <laughs> then what is your good confession? Jesus is Lord. Amen. <laughs> well, Chang, with that confession, we can now baptize you into the... Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all your, all, all your sins will be forgiven. You'll be added to God's kingdom and become a part of God's family here in St. Louis. We love you, brother. Let's get it done.
up with me. Go in peace.